I want to talk to you about a new feminism for the 21st century. There are three pillars to this new feminism. Dignity, the word no, and men. That's right, men. But before I expound on these three ideas, you need to know something about me. I was very involved in the feminist movement, including being on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women. For this, I feel much pride and some guilt. Pride because feminism has pushed forward some very important and needed changes. And guilt because it has also done a lot of damage. My work now is to reverse that damage. So in that spirit, let's talk about the first pillar of this new feminism, dignity. Dignity is at the core of what feminism should always be about. Dignity means that a woman should be able to freely choose her own path in life. That's what feminism once held. But does it still? Ask almost any female college student today what she aspires to be, and she'll list any number of career choices. The one she won't list is wife and mother. In fact, any time someone has the temerity to suggest that a woman might want to look for a husband while in college, as a very successful Princeton grad recently did in a letter to the school's newspaper, feminists go nuts. A new feminism will value and respect all responsible choices. And while we're talking about dignity, I can't think of anything less dignified for women than the feminist belief that in the sexual arena, women are like and therefore ought to act like men. Is this what the truly liberated woman wants? To have casual sex and think nothing of it like men do? That's what feminism aspires to? Sad to say, the answer has too often been yes. So let's add this up. Feminism has downplayed the desire for women to have a family, while at the same time hyping the rewards of career and casual sex. Not exactly a recipe for success or happiness. The second pillar of a new feminism is the word no. It's very much tied in with the first pillar. Throughout history, women have made great use of the word no. no. Of course, many times women said yes when they should have said no, and that's the basis of more than a few classic stories and novels. But this was the exception, not the rule. There is great power in that word no, and women, for the most part, knew how to wield that power. But in the last few decades, they've lost it, and the consequences have been catastrophic. Women, who fought not to be treated as sex objects, have become more objectified than ever. You see it everywhere, in music videos, on billboards, in the hookup culture, on campuses. And now we have the tawdry spectacle of teenage girls sexually pursuing teenage boys the way boys pursued girls. How did this happen? Because feminism began to advocate that women should behave like men. Whatever men did and however they did it, that's what women should do. Feminists were angry at men, but they wanted to be like them at the same time. No wonder our society is so confused. <gasps> women are robbing themselves of the ability to say no. The solution is to take that power back. This is especially true for young women. No. Saying no means I will not be defined by anyone else, not by feminists and not by men's sexual desires. That is female power. This is a good segue to my third pillar of a new feminism, men. It is easy for feminists to forget this, but it was men who gave up their monopoly on political power and gave women the right to vote. Men who invented birth control, the refrigerator, the washing machine, and so many other devices that liberated women. And men are different from women. Academics like to speculate that men and women are basically the same, that they're only socialized differently. But as George Orwell famously noted, that's an idea that only an intellectual would be foolish enough to believe. Moreover, the sexes need each other. For example, women civilize men. It's what we're supposed to do. But in order to accomplish this critical task, we must preserve our dignity, not be afraid to use the word no, and see men as partners, not as competitors, let alone oppressors. That's the way to a new feminism and the way to a better world for both sexes. I'm Tammy Bruce for Prager University.
I recently discovered something startling about myself. It turns out that I'm a racist, sexist, misogynist. This came as quite a shock to me. How did this happen? As a person of color, a single woman with a graduate degree who grew up poor in a home without a father, I had a clear political path to follow, and I followed it. I voted for Barack Obama, twice. After all, we share the same skin color. His father was from Africa, mine was too. What other reasons did I need? I was inspired to see a black man rise to the highest office in the land. I believed his ascent would herald a new beginning, a new era of racial healing and harmony. We would finally have that frank discussion about race that everyone always talks about. I was also inspired by his wife. I was thrilled to see such a strong, opinionated black woman take the national stage. But then something happened. Actually, several somethings. I realized there was a big contradiction in my own life. I considered myself a free thinker, but I was thinking exactly what I was supposed to. I decided to start asking questions. I belonged to several campus feminist groups. I was even teaching feminism to inner city girls. Part of that teaching involved making the case for abortion. These girls needed to know that they had the right to make decisions about their own bodies. Surely, I thought, that's empowerment. But one day I asked myself, isn't it men who benefit most from consequence-free sex? Doesn't that give them even more power over women? And of course, abortion certainly doesn't empower the woman it prevents from ever being born. When I began to ask my other feminist friends how they reconcile these issues, they just got angry. I was called anti-woman, even by progressive men. But I'm not anti-woman, I thought. I am a woman. I just don't want to be a weak one. I want to be strong, like Michelle. At about the same time, while I was a student at the University of Texas at Dallas, the UT Austin Department of African Diaspora Studies released a statement in which they said, and I quote, African Americans are disproportionately affected by the saturation of our society by firearms. We demand that firearms be banned in all spaces occupied by black people on our campus. Wait a second, I thought, why would you want to ban firearms only in black areas? Doesn't that mean that you either think black people are more dangerous than other people or less worthy of protection? These questions did not endear me to my progressive friends. I was called a race traitor even by white people. But I'm not anti-black. I am black. I just want to be safe, like Barack. I realized I didn't have a good answer. I only had more questions. Like why were blacks doing so poorly in cities that had been run by Democrats for decades? Was it racism and sexism that was holding people back? Or was it something else? The more questions I asked, the less popular I became. But here's the funny thing. I started to feel better about myself. I decided that the very definition of empowerment required me to take responsibility for my own life. I wasn't going to be anyone's victim, which meant I had to protect myself. So I bought a gun. I started to advocate for gun rights. That cost me more friends. I joined the pro-life movement and walked in the March for Life. More friends, gone. Then I crossed the line. I voted Republican, the party that views me as an empowered individual, able to shape my own destiny, not as a member of a victim group. And that's how I became a racist, sexist, misogynist. I'm Antonia Okafor for Prager University. Culture matters. It's the primary source of social progress or regression. Nowhere do we see this more clearly than in the status of women. The Judeo-Christian culture and perhaps a more up to civilization has produced over time the law codes, language, and material prosperity that have greatly elevated women's status. But this progress is not shared everywhere. There are still hundreds of millions of people that live in a culture the Islamic, for instance, that takes female inferiority for granted. Until recently, these cultures, 
the Western and the Islamic were for the most part separated. But that is changing, dramatically so. Large numbers of immigrant men from the Middle East, South Asia, and various parts of Africa have brought a different set of values to the West, specifically Europe. More than a million arrived in 2015 alone. More are on the way. As a result, crimes against girls and women, groping, harassments, assaults, and rape have risen sharply. These crimes illustrate the stark difference between the Western culture of the victims and that of the perpetrators. Let me be clear, not all immigrant men, or even most, indulge in sex attacks or approve of such attacks. But it's a grave mistake to deny that the value system of the attackers is radically different from the value system of the West. In the West, women are emancipated and sexually autonomous. Religiosity and sexual behavior or sexual restraint is determined by women's individual wishes. The other value system is one in which women are viewed as either commodities, that is, their worth depends on their virginity, or on the level of a prostitute if they're guilty of public immodesty, wearing a short skirt, for example. I do not believe these value systems can coexist. The question is which value system will prevail? Unfortunately, this remains an open question. The current situation in Europe is deeply troubling. Not only are Muslim women within Europe subject to considerable oppression in many ways, such norms now risk spreading to non-Muslim women who face harassment from Muslim men. One would think that Western feminists in the United States and Europe would be very disturbed by this obvious misogyny. But sadly, with few exceptions, this does not appear to be the case. Common among many Western feminists is a type of moral confusion in which women are said to be oppressed everywhere, and that this oppression, in feminist Eve Ensler's words, is exactly the same around the world, in the West, just as in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. To me, this suggests too much moral relativism and an inadequate understanding of Sharia law. It is true that the situation for women in the West is not perfect, but can anyone truly deny that women enjoy greater freedom and opportunities in the United States, France, and Finland than they do in Iran, Pakistan, or Saudi Arabia? Other feminists have also argued that non-Western women do not need saving and that any suggestion that they need help from Western feminists is insulting and condescending to non-Western women. My perspective is a practical one. Any efforts that help Muslim women, whether they live in the West or under Islamic governments, should be encouraged. Every effort to pressure these governments to change unjust laws should be supported. Western feminists and female Western leaders have a simple choice to make. Either excuse the inexcusable or demand reform in cultures and religious doctrines that continue to oppress women. Nothing illustrates this better than what happened in Cologne, Germany on New Year's Eve 2015. That night, during the city's traditional celebrations, numerous German women, 467 at the last count, reported being sexually harassed or assaulted by men of North African and Arab origin. Within two months, 73 suspects had been identified, most of them from North Africa. Twelve of them have been linked to sexual crimes. Yet, in response to the attacks, Cologne's feminist mayor Henriette Reker issued an arm's-length guideline to women. Just keep an arm's-length distance between you and a mob of Arab men, she advised Cologne's female population, and you will be fine. Mayor Reker's comments underline the seriousness of the problem. A culture clash is upon us. The first step in resolving it is to unapologetically defend the values that have allowed women to flourish. Feminists with their organizations, networks, and lobbying power need to be on the front lines of this battle. Their relevance depends on it. And so does the well-being of countless women, Western and non-Western. I'm Ayan Hirsi Ali of Harvard University for Prager University. If for the same work women only make 77 cents for every dollar a man makes, why don't businesses hire only women? 
Wages are the biggest expense for most businesses, so hiring only women would reduce costs by nearly a quarter, and that would go right to the bottom line. Don't businesses want to be profitable, or are they really just bad at math? Well, actually, it's the feminists, celebrities, and politicians spreading this wage gap myth who have the math problem. Here's why. The 77 cents on the dollar statistic is calculated by dividing the median earnings of all women working full-time by the median earnings of all men working full-time. In other words, if the average income of all men is, say, $40,000 a year, and the average annual income of all women is, say, $30,800, that would mean that women earn 77 cents for every dollar a man earns. 30,800 divided by 40,000 equals 0.77. But these calculations don't reveal a gender wage injustice because they don't take into account occupation, position, education, or hours worked per week. Even a study by the American Association of University Women, a feminist organization, shows that the actual wage gap shrinks to only 6.6 .6 cents when you factor in different choices men and women make. And the key word here is choice. The small wage gap that does exist has nothing to do with paying women less, let alone with sexism. It has to do with differences in individual career choices that men and women make. In 2009, the U.S. Department of Labor released a paper that examined more than 50 peer-reviewed studies and concluded that the off-cited 23-cent wage gap may be almost entirely the result of individual choices being made by both male and female workers. Well, let's look at some of those choices. Georgetown University compiled a list of the five best-paying college majors and the percentage of men and women majoring in those fields. Number one best-paying major, petroleum engineering, 87% male. Number two, pharmaceutical sciences, 48% male. Three, mathematics and computer science, 67% male. Four, aerospace engineering, 88% male. Five, chemical engineering, 72% male. Notice that women outrepresent men in only one of the five top paying majors by only a few percentage points. Now consider the same studies list of the five worst paying college majors. Number one, counseling and psychology, 74% female. Two, early childhood education, 97% female. Three, theology and religious vocations, 66% male. Four, Human Services and Community Organization, 81% female. And five, Social Work, 88% female. Here, it's the women who lead in all but one category. Even within the same profession, men and women make different career choices that impact how much money they make. Take nursing, where male nurses, on the whole, earn 18% more than female nurses. The reason? Male nurses gravitate to the best-paying nursing specialties, they work longer hours, and disproportionately find jobs in cities with the highest compensation. Now here's how one expert on nursing compensation, Professor Linda Aiken of the University of Pennsylvania, sums up the data. Career choices and educational differences explain most, if not all, the gender gap in nursing. The Department of Labor paper concluded that once these differences are accounted for across all professions, the unexplained wage gap is somewhere between 4.8 and 7 percent, almost identical to the 6.6 .6 percentage gap found by the AAUW. But why is there any gap at all? No one knows for sure, as both the AAUW and the Labor Department concede. There are so many variables that drive wages that no single study can cover them all. Few wage gap studies control for variables such as dangerous work environment. Men are vastly overrepresented, for example, on oil rigs. And here's another variable. Men are more willing and able to work long hours without advance notice. According to Harvard economist Claudia Golden, even if two lawyers have the same education, same specialty, and work the same number of hours, firms pay more to someone who is willing to always be on call and ready to be in the office when the firm needs them, as opposed to wanting a more regular schedule. This isn't sexism. It's just common sense. With more realistic categories and definitions, whatever wage gap remains would certainly narrow to the point of vanishing. So it seems that business leaders aren't bad at math simply because they don't only hire women. Those who claim that for the same work, women earn 77 cents on the dollar compared to men, on the other hand, 
are not merely bad at math, but at telling the truth. I'm Christina Hoff Summers of the American Enterprise Institute for Prager University. Are American college campuses rape cultures? Are they dangerous places where sexual assaults against women are happening at an alarming rate? According to many gender activists, academics, and politicians, the answer is yes. Here's what the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, said in 2014. We know the numbers. One in five of every one of those young women who is dropped off for that first day of school before they finish school will be assaulted, will be assaulted in her college years. Let's take a closer look at the Vice President's claim. Rape is a horrific crime, and rapists are rightfully despised. We have strict laws against sexual assault that everyone wants to see enforced. But while rape is certainly a very serious problem, there is simply no evidence of a national campus rape epidemic, and there is certainly no evidence that sexual violence is a cultural norm in 21st century America. In fact, rates of rape in the U.S. are very low, and they've been declining for decades. Why would it be any different on a college campus? Where then does the one in five rate that Vice President Biden cites come from? Well, it turns out it comes from a study conducted over the internet at two large universities, one in the Midwest and one in the South. The survey was anonymous, no one's claims were verified, and terms were not clearly defined. In round numbers, a total of 5,000 women participated. Based on their responses, the authors, not the participants, determined that 1,000 had been victims of some type of non-consensual or unwanted sexual contact. And voila! From one vaguely worded, unscientific survey, we suddenly arrive at a rape culture on college campuses. Tellingly, the study authors have since explicitly stated that it's inappropriate to use their survey to make that claim. Much more comprehensive data from the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics, or BJS, estimates that about 1 in 52.6 college women will be victims of rape or sexual assault over the course of four years. That's far too many, but it's a long way from 1 in 5. The same BJS data also reveal that women in college are safer from rape than college-aged women who are not enrolled in college. But the truth doesn't serve the purposes of feminist activists or vote-seeking politicians. Lies work much better, and the one in five claim is tantamount to a lie. Here are just a few examples of what this lie has wrought. At Scripps College, Pulitzer Prize-winning commentator George Will was disinvited from giving a speech. The reason? He had dared to question the rape culture mantra in a column he wrote. At the all-women Wellesley College, students demanded that the administration remove a campus sculpture of a sleepwalking man wearing only underpants. Why? Well, because the image of a nearly naked male could trigger memories of sexual assault for victims. According to Harvard Law professor Jeannie Sook, students now ask teachers not to include questions about rape law on exams for fear that such disturbing questions might cause them to perform less well. And at Brown University, students were so traumatized by a debate on the subject of campus sexual assault that activists organized a safe room equipped with coloring books, Play-Doh, calming music, and a video of frolicking puppies. No less absurd are the attempts by colleges and legislators to cure this non-existent plague. In California and New York, students now have to live by so-called affirmative consent laws. The California law says that affirmative consent by all parties must be ongoing throughout a sexual activity, while the New York law says that silence or lack of resistance in and of itself does not demonstrate consent. Confused? Pity the poor college students who have to figure this out. If it wasn't so serious, it would be laughable. But it's not funny to a growing number of young men who find themselves accused of sexual assault, publicly shamed, and then brought before campus judicial panels that are guided by rape culture theory. In such proceedings, due process is an afterthought. It's guilty because accused. But here's the best way to prove that the one in five number is phony. Ask yourself this question. 
Would you send your daughter to a place for four years where there was a 20% chance she would be raped or sexually assaulted? Of course not. Good rarely, if ever, comes from lies. The one in five rape culture lie is no exception. I'm Caroline Kitchens of the American Enterprise Institute for Prager University. Do you want equality between men and women? I do, which is why I own a gun. My Glock 43 is my equalizer. Two NRA for you? Then let's take a step back and think about this. I will start with this premise. Men are physically stronger than women. I know, even this is controversial these days, but men have more muscle mass and greater bone density. They run faster and punch harder. It's called biology. If a woman is going to protect herself against a man who intends to do her serious harm, she needs to even the odds. And what's the best way for her to do that? Own a gun and know how to use it. Given this, you would think that feminists would be lining up in front of gun shops, spending quality time at the shooting range, and filing for concealed carry permits. But when was the last time you heard a feminist speak out for women owning guns? You haven't, because feminists aren't for gun ownership, they're for taking guns away from women. Well, you might say, if no one owned a gun, then everybody would be safer. Yes, and it would be nice if cheesecake was a diet food. There are over 300 million guns in the United States, and that's not going to change anytime soon. But even if we could build a giant magnet, fly it across the country, and snap up every gun, it wouldn't much matter to women's safety. In Great Britain, where it's almost impossible to get a gun, a woman is three times more likely to be raped than in America, according to a study by David Kopel, a professor of constitutional law at Denver University. Here's another telling comparison between gun-free UK and gun-owning US. In the United States, only about 13% of home burglaries take place when the occupants are home. But in the UK, almost 60% do. Professor Kopel explains the disparity. American burglars avoid occupied homes because of the risk of getting shot. English burglars prefer occupied homes because there will be wallets and purses with cash. And by the way, an assailant doesn't need a gun to be dangerous. What do you do if you're a woman and a man comes at you with a knife or just his bare hands? If you want to depend on pepper spray or a whistle, okay. But I think your finger on the trigger of a gun would be more effective. Take the example of mail carrier Catherine Lada. After she had been assaulted and raped by her ex-boyfriend, Lada tried to purchase a firearm. She was told it might take a month to get a permit. I'll be dead by then, she recalls telling the clerk. That afternoon, she went to a rough part of town and bought a handgun. Five hours later, her ex-boyfriend attacked her outside of her home. She shot him in self-defense and saved her life. I should add that firing a gun is very rare. Just carrying it, let alone brandishing it, is a deterrent. And isn't that the issue? Personal safety? How is a woman supposed to defend herself? What if an intruder breaks into her home? Liberal TV personality Sherry Shepard answered this question a few years ago. At one in the morning, the alarm in our house went off, Shepard told her co-host on the popular daytime show, The View. As the alarm blared, her husband, Sal, went downstairs to look around. If something happened to him, a terrified Shepard realized she had no way to protect herself or her son, Jeffrey. All I had was this wicker basket. I don't have a bat, nothing. We're going to get a gun, I told Sal. This just made me realize how vulnerable you are if you can't protect your home. And the police were wonderful. They came about seven minutes later. But to me, that's seven minutes too late. Luckily for Shepard, the incident was a false alarm. But there are lots of cases where the alarm is real, especially in high crime areas. Yet every year, progressives push for more and more gun control without ever considering who will pay the price. It won't be the bad guys. They always get the guns they want. It will be the good women who need to equal the odds in a dangerous confrontation with a man. Women owning guns shouldn't be a partisan issue. In fact, it's a women's rights issue. I'm all for equality between the sexes. 
and I practice what I preach. That's why I own a gun. I'm Katie Pavlich for Prager University. Rape, murder, war. They all have one thing in common. Men. Aggression, violence, ambition unchecked by conscience, all the stuff of toxic masculinity, right? And the solution is obvious. Make men less toxic. Make men less masculine. Make men more like women. But I'm here to tell you that that way of thinking is not only wrong, it's dangerous. Here's why. When you try to make men more like women, you don't get less toxic masculinity. You get more. Why? Because bad men don't become good when they stop being men. They become good when they stop being bad. Aggression, violence, and unbridled ambition can't be eliminated from the male psyche. They can only be harnessed. And when they are harnessed, they are tools for good, not for harm. The same masculine traits that bring destruction also defeat tyranny. The traits that foster greed also build economies. The traits that drive men to take foolish risks also drive men to take heroic risks. The answer to toxic masculinity isn't less masculinity. It's better masculinity. And we know what that looks like. It's a young man opening the door for a girl on their first date. It's a father working long hours to provide for his family. It's a soldier risking his life to defend his country. The growing problem in today's society isn't that men are too masculine. It's that they're not masculine enough. When men embrace their masculinity in a way that is healthy and productive, they are leaders, warriors, and heroes. When they deny their masculinity, they run away from responsibilities, leaving destruction and despair in their wake. The consequences can be seen everywhere. One in four fathers now lives apart from his children. And children who grew up without a dad are generally more depressed than their peers who have a mother and a father. They are at far greater risk for incarceration, teen pregnancy, and poverty. 71% of high school dropouts are fatherless. Of all the rocks upon which we build our lives, family is the most important. And we are called to recognize and honor how critical every father is to that foundation. That was said by then-Senator Barack Obama in 2008. If we are honest with ourselves, he went on, we'll admit that too many fathers are missing from too many lives and too many homes. As much as we try to deny the need for real masculine strength in society, there's no denying its necessity. Healthy families and strong communities depend on the leadership and bravery of good men. Yet, the current trend is to feminize young men in the hopes of achieving some utopian notion of equality and peace. And it starts at the earliest ages. In the school classroom, boys are invariably the problem. On the playground, aggressive games like dodgeball have long been banished. We tell young men that their intrinsic desire to compete is wrong. Everybody gets a trophy. Don't run up the score. This anti-male tilt continues on through higher education and into the workplace. It has created millions of tentative men, unhappy women, and confused boys and girls. Here's a secret that every woman knows. Women want real men. Men they can count on and, yes, look up to. No amount of feminist theory will change that. I don't know any woman at any age who is attracted to a passive man who looks to her to be his provider, protector, and leader. Every woman I know wants a strong, responsible man. That's not a consequence of a social construct or cultural pressure. It's innate. The devaluation of masculinity won't end well because feminine passive men don't stop evil. Passive men don't defend, protect, or provide. Passive men don't lead. Passive men don't do the things we have always needed men to do for society to thrive. In his book, The Abolition of Man, English social philosopher C.S. Lewis writes about this problem. He describes the tension between cerebral man and visceral man. By his intellect, Lewis explains, Man is mere spirit, and by his appetite, mere animal. We need both. Take away one, and you're left with a man who's either weak or wicked. And in a world of wickedness, weak men are nothing more than enablers of wicked men. Rape, murder, war. They all have two things in common. Bad men who do the raping, murdering, and warring, and weak men who won't stop them. We need good men who will. 
It's not masculinity that's toxic. It's the lack of it. I'm Ali Stuckey for Prager University. Have you ever pushed a beach ball underwater? What happens? It pops right back up. Because of its nature, a beach ball will not stay submerged. The same is true for men and women. Each has a distinct nature that will always rise to the surface. Simply put, men and women are different. They look different. They have different body parts, different biology, different hormones. They express emotions differently. They have different needs and desires. Now, if you told that to your great-grandmother who never went to college, never used an iPhone, never used social media, she would have asked, why are you telling me something so obvious? But if you said the same thing to a graduate student in sociology or anthropology, let alone gender studies, they'd say you were wrong. Men and women are basically the same, the grad student would say. Sexuality exists on a spectrum. It's determined by people's internal feelings. Between great granny and the gender studies PhD, I'm going with granny and her common sense. To believe that men and women are basically the same is to believe a delusion. A delusion is a belief that contradicts reality. You can say you're Napoleon, but that doesn't make you Napoleon. You can try to socialize girls into behaving like boys or boys into behaving like girls, but it won't work. You can push the beach ball underwater, but not for long. New York pediatrician George Lazarus tells the story of a couple who didn't want their young daughter to conform to the usual pink and blue stereotype. So they bought her a set of toy trucks. The father went to her room to check on her and she told him to be quiet. The trucks were sleeping. A similar story about his twin daughters pretending their daddy truck was carrying the baby truck was told by the former president of Harvard University, Lawrence Summers. Give a little boy a truck or just about any other object and sooner or later, he will turn it into a weapon. That's reality. Believing delusions makes people say and do foolish, self-destructive things. Here's an example. If men and women are basically the same, they want the same things from sex, right? But this isn't true. Women tend to be far more selective about partners with whom they choose to be intimate. That's female nature. Men tend to be, shall we say, far less discerning. That's male nature. Once, this was considered common sense. Nobody had to go to graduate school or do an academic study to figure it out. But now everything is upside down. We're trying to push the beach ball underwater. Today, male and female college students who, 50 years ago, lived in separate buildings and had supervised curfews, now share the same dorm rooms and even the same bathrooms. And sex, well, it's just another form of college entertainment. It means nothing and has no consequences, emotionally, psychologically, or physically. But certainly, as far as most women are concerned, this just isn't true. If sex doesn't mean anything, why would any woman feel violated by an uninvited touch? Do you think a man whose leg is touched by a woman he doesn't know feels as violated as a woman does when her leg is touched by a man she doesn't know? If sex doesn't mean anything, why did Jennifer Lawrence say to The Hollywood Reporter after filming an intimate scene with her co-star Chris Pratt in the movie Passengers, I knew it was my job, but I couldn't tell my stomach that. That was the most vulnerable I've ever been. She felt vulnerable in that scene but not in others, because she knows even acting out in a movie scene, sex is a big deal. That's one of the many reasons it has traditionally been confined to marriage, and why experience and research shows that sex within marriage is more satisfying emotionally, psychologically, and physically, not to mention spiritually, than sex outside of marriage. Anyone who tells you that men and women are basically the same and that sex means as little to women as it can to many men is not telling you the truth. They're making stuff up. They're pushing an agenda. Theirs, not yours. So trust granny, trust common sense, and remember the beach ball. I'm Sean McDowell, Associate Professor of Theology and Philosophy at Biola University for Prager University. After years of studying men and women, I have come to realize that a key to a happy relationship with the opposite sex is to recognize that we have two natures. 
One I call human animal, the other human spirit. Human spirit is the elevated part of us. It enables us to be our best selves. Human animal is the more primitive part, the instinctive part that lashes out, often in response to a primal fear of scarcity or competition. When that happens, I call it an attack of human animal. It's a cave woman or caveman attack. And what happens is that there's literally an eclipse of human spirit. So human spirit is still there, but it's in the background, overshadowed by the animal reaction that is driven by a perception of a threat to one's survival. <laughs> so when men and women perceive a threat to their survival, they react by instinct. An instinct is defined as a primal biological urge impelling a response that brings relief of tension. Now I bring that up because it's a good place to look. Whenever you're experiencing tension, there's a very good chance that you're reacting instinctively from your caveman or cavewoman and not from human spirit. Now, if we're going to bring out the best in ourselves and in each other, we have to understand what causes an attack of human animal. And what does that is any time that we perceive that our survival is in jeopardy. So it could be a threat to our physical safety, it could be a threat to property we're attached to, it could be a threat to our identity, to our sense of self. Now, if we're going to bring out the best of each other, we have to understand that the masculine and feminine aspects of our natures experience survival and therefore safety and security in different ways. For the masculine, survival depends upon one's ability to produce results. So the masculine will feel safe and secure when they have the greatest opportunity to produce results. And that comes when they are respected and trusted by the people that they work with and the people that they care for. The feminine, on the other hand, experiences safety and security when she feels connected when she's getting the attention and the interest that she needs from the people around her that give her a nearly constant sense of being connected and therefore safe and secure. Now one of the problems is that men and women have instincts that literally antagonize the other's caveman or cavewoman. So, for example, the way that a man thinks, which we call single focus, will cause him to pay attention to one thing at a time. So if he's watching television, the woman in his life may feel ignored and she'll get this incredible sense of tension in her body and she'll try to do things to connect with him and connect with him and connect with him, which as a single focus person, he's gonna experience as an interruption and be annoyed by it and cause a downward spiral. On the other hand, women have an instinct that causes them to want to be scrupulously accurate in their details. So if a man is telling a story and he says something happened on a Tuesday that she thinks happened on a Wednesday, she'll interrupt him and correct that story. If this is in front of other people, it's going to cause a problem because if it's someone whose respect and trust he needs and she's now intimated that he lies or exaggerates, that's gonna be a problem. Now, on the other hand, by understanding these ways that we antagonize each other's instincts, we can behave in a way that instead brings out the best in each other. So for example, for a man to overcome his natural respect for privacy mm. and instead ask questions that show that he's interested in her. He can even ask her what are her favorite questions to be asked. Mm -hmm. And for a woman to recognize the tension she feels about the accuracy of details and realize that maybe this isn't so important, just let him tell the story. You don't have to correct him on that. And then he can maintain the respect and trust that he needs. By understanding the differences in the way that men and women think, communicate, process information, and solve problems, men and women can learn to bring out the best in each other instead of causing an attack of human animal. I'm Allison Armstrong for Prager University. Being a normal boy is a serious liability in today's classroom. Boys tend to be disorganized and restless. Some have even been known to be noisy and hard to manage. Sound like any boy you know? 
but increasingly our schools have little patience for what only a couple of decades ago would have been described as boyishness. A psychologist, Michael Thompson, has aptly observed, girls' behavior is the gold standard in schools. Boys are treated like defective girls. Now, as a result, these defective girls are not faring well academically. Compared with girls, boys earn lower grades, they win fewer honors, they're far less likely to go to college. Boys are languishing academically while girls are prospering. In an ever more knowledge-based economy, this is not a recipe for a successful society. We need to start thinking about how we can make our grade school classrooms more boy-friendly. Well, here are four reforms that would make a very good start. One, turn boys into readers. In all age groups, across all ethnic lines, boys score lower than girls on national reading tests. Good reading skills, need I say, are critical to academic and workplace success. A major study in the UK discovered, not surprisingly, that girls prefer fiction, magazines, and poetry, while boys prefer comics and nonfiction. Boys whose eyes glaze over if forced to read Little House on the Prairie uh, may be riveted by the Guinness Book of Records. Cool. Boys will read if given materials that interest them. If you're looking for suggestions for books that have proved irresistible to boys, go to guysread.com. Two, inspire the male imagination. Celebrated writing instructor Ralph Fletcher contends that too many teachers take what is called the confessional poet as the classroom ideal. Personal narratives full of emotions and self-disclosure, these are stories girls commonly write, and these are prized, whereas action stories describing, say, a skateboard competition or a monster devouring a city, these are not. I recently read about a third grader in Southern California named Justin, who loved science fiction, pirates, and battles. Well, an alarmed teacher summoned his parents to school to discuss the picture the eight-year-old had drawn of a sword fight, which included several decapitated heads. The teacher expressed grave concern about Justin's values. The boy's father was astonished, huh? not by his son's drawing, which to him was typical boy stuff, but by the teacher's overwrought and female-centered reaction. If boys are constantly subject to disapproval for their interests and enthusiasms, they're likely to become disengaged and lag further behind. Our schools need to work with, not against, the kinetic imaginations of boys. Three, zero out, zero tolerance. Boys are nearly five times as likely to be expelled from preschool as girls. And in grades K through 12, boys account for nearly 70% of suspensions. Now, this is often for minor acts of insubordination and sometimes for entirely innocent behavior. Hardly a week goes by without a news story about a young boy running afoul of a school's zero tolerance policy. Josh Welsh, age seven, was recently sent home from his Maryland school for nibbling off the corners of a strawberry Pop-Tart into the shape of a gun. Josh, like many other boys punished for violating zero tolerance policies, was guilty of nothing more than being a typical seven-year-old boy. Four, bring back recess. Believe it or not, recess may soon be a thing of the past. According to research summarized by the Science Daily, since the 1970s, school children have lost close to 50% of their unstructured outdoor playtime. And much-loved games have vanished from schoolyards. In schools throughout the country, games like dodgeball, Red Rover, even tag, have all but disappeared. Too damaging to self-esteem or too violent being the usual excuse. One popular classroom guide suggests tug of war be replaced with tug of peace. Boys need to work off their energy. They need to be free to play games they enjoy. And keeping them cooped up and inside all day will not help them learn. As our schools become more feeling-centered, more competition-free, more sedentary, they move further away from the needs of boys. We need to reverse the boy-averse trends. Male underachievement is everyone's concern. These are our sons. These are the young men with whom our daughters will build a future. 
If boys are in trouble, so are we all. I'm Christina Hoff Summers at the American Enterprise Institute for Prager University. I am an anti-feminist. Feminism is a mean-spirited, small-minded, and oppressive philosophy that can poison relations between the sexes, relations which for most of us provide some of life's deepest pleasures and consolations. Feminism has attempted to bully us all into accepting an obvious lie, the lie that men and women have the same powers, talents, proclivities, and desires, and that consequently, any discrepancy in their professional paths is due to bigotry and must be corrected by force of culture and law. By shoving that lie down our throats, feminism has made both men and women less happy and less free. Now, I'm going to have to speak in generalities, and I understand there are all kinds of exceptions to what I'm about to say, but the generalities remain generally valid. Feminism denigrates masculinity in men by relentlessly calling us toxic for our flaws rather than appreciating our natural qualities of energy, risk-taking, and leadership. But it also denigrates femininity in women, working to replace most women's commitment to relationship and child-rearing with male obsessions, such as career status and strength. What's the result? Take a look at the quintessential feminist icon, Rosie the Riveter, flexing her muscle. The truth is, any man of the same size and fitness can make a bigger, stronger muscle than Rosie can. By herding women away from their feminine natures, feminism seeks to transform them from first-rate women into second-rate men. Now, perhaps you'll protest. Isn't feminism simply the idea that women have the same human rights as men? No, it isn't. That philosophy is called classical liberalism, which holds that we are all equally endowed by God with the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But wait, doesn't the Declaration of Independence say that all men are created equal? Yes, classical liberalism was an idea conceived by, and largely for, Christian white men. But, like all ideas, good and bad, classical liberalism has evolved over time according to its internal logic, so it now includes all races and both sexes. Good job, Christian white men. Thanks for the great idea. As its excuse for the damage it does to our lives, Feminism has developed the historical mythology that men have oppressed women and now must be suppressed in their turn to even things out. Let me propose a different narrative that has the advantage of possibly being true. Insofar as men and women are physical creations, their central purpose is the production of more human beings. Women are therefore fashioned in body and mind to make and nurture children and men to protect and support those children during their relatively long maturation period. All societies shaped themselves around these necessities. They created structures that formalized gender roles and attempted to ensure the paternity of children so that men would care for their own. In many societies, these structures became increasingly ritualistic and oppressive for women. But the opposite happened in the Christian West. Why? Take a look at your Bible, Proverbs 31. The biblical ideal of a good woman is not only strong, kind, and wise, she's also a creative and economic dynamo. Christianity sanctified motherhood in the person of Mary and celebrated women's fortitude and virtue in the female saints. The church created a version of marriage intended to protect women and designed the philosophy of chivalry, which instructed men to use their superior strength for women, not against them. Individuals can be incredibly abusive to one another, men and women both. But over time, Christendom tended to elevate, protect, and ultimately include women as women in the great enterprise of Western civilization. Now, the developments of modernity have created special challenges for women. Industry removed clothing and food production from the home to the factory and thus deprived homemakers of their traditional businesses. Children lost their monetary value to parents by leaving home to fend for themselves. So, while motherhood and homemaking remain the most important spiritual activities of humankind, modernity has stripped those enterprises of their former economic power. But in a Western civilization dedicated to equal rights, these challenges come along with fresh opportunities. New technologies and effective birth control allow individual women to tailor gender roles to their personal liking or abandon them altogether. None of this is a reason to attack men. 
In fact, these new opportunities are largely the result of men's inventions and their ideas. And none of it requires women to abandon the femininity which is one of the graces of our world. It's just change and progress, that's all. With honest thought and goodwill, we can adapt over time without the angry, bitter, and dishonest attacks on our human nature by feminists. I'm Andrew Claven for Prager University. The bigger the government, the better for women. Is that statement true or false? Well, if party affiliation is any indicator, most women under the age of 40 would say true. Young women, especially single women, are among the left's most loyal supporters. This isn't surprising, given that programs like government-subsidized childcare and government-mandated paid family leave sound like things that make life better for women. But do they really? Most European governments provide subsidies that allow women to stay home for months, even years, following the birth of a child. And some European countries require employers to offer female employees part-time and flexible work arrangements. So have European women benefited from these programs? The answer is no, unless you think lower wages, fewer jobs, and fewer management opportunities benefit women. Why is this the case? Because these supposedly women-friendly government mandates change the way businesses evaluate female employees. It encourages companies to assume that women will not only cost them more, but that they'll be less productive than men. Spain is a good example. In 1999, that country passed a law giving women with young children the right to work reduced hours. But a study by economists at the IE Business School in Madrid and at Queens College of the City University of New York found that women paid a big price in lost opportunities. Companies were less likely to hire women of childbearing age, less likely to promote them, and more likely to dismiss them compared with men. When Chile tried similar policies, similar outcomes resulted. In the words of Maria Prada, an economist for the Inter-American Development Bank, the purpose of the law was to help women participate in the labor force and achieve more work-family balance, and it's doing the opposite. A study of 22 countries by two Cornell economists showed that in countries with the most extensive benefits for women, women are more likely to be in dead-end jobs and less likely to become managers or top executives. This is because once the government mandates additional benefits for women, employers place them on the mommy track, meaning they assume women will want to work fewer hours, whether that's true or not. This might explain why, in the United States where these benefits are not mandated, women account for more than 40% of senior managers, while in more progressive Europe, that number is a little over 30%. But big government doesn't throw obstacles only at women trying to get ahead. It throws obstacles at women struggling to get by. Here we don't have to go to Europe to find examples. There are plenty in the United States. Take the issue of occupational licenses government regulations requiring a license to pursue particular professions. Sure, people operating dangerous and complex equipment should have to get special training, take tests, and be licensed. But why are occupational licenses required for hair shampooers and braiders? In some states, licenses are even required for interior designers and florists. Getting licenses can require hundreds of hours of schooling and entail major fees. That's not about protecting consumers or public safety. That's a source of revenue for city and state governments and a way for some politically powerful lobby groups to keep out competition. And since more women obtain occupational licenses than men, women are disproportionately hurt. So what's the solution? Less government, not more. Since 2017, a combination of tax cuts and deregulation, meaning less government, have been a boon for women. Women's weekly median earnings have gone up by almost 5%. The unemployment rate for women has fallen to 3.4%, a historic low. And more women are starting businesses than ever before. Between 2017 and 2018, women started almost 2,000 businesses a day. Right now, there are an estimated 12.3 million women-owned businesses, a 6% increase since 2016. And here's the topper. 
Since 2017, more and more businesses have voluntarily offered family benefits to employees. Why? Because the more companies have to compete for workers, the more benefits workers receive. That's how the free market works, and the opposite of how big government works. The free market, it turns out, does a much better job at creating opportunities for women than big government does. This not only means better jobs and better pay for women, but also the chance to craft the lives they actually want. After all, not every woman needs or values a generous childcare package. But when the government mandates benefits, they become, in effect, taxes that every woman and man has to pay. The bigger the government, the better for women? You might want to rethink that one. I'm Carrie Lucas, President of Independent Women's Forum for Prager University. Women in the United States and in Western Europe are the freest and most liberated in human history. In many ways, they are not merely doing as well as men, they are doing better. Women's emancipation is one of the glories of Western civilization and one of the great chapters in the history of freedom. So why then are those in the women's movement, such as the leaders and members of activist groups like the National Organization for Women, the professors in women's studies departments at our colleges, and many women in the media, why are they still so dissatisfied? These feminists hardly acknowledge women's progress. Yes, they concede that some advances have been made, but the fact that most women reject their activist brand of feminism and think of themselves as free is, for this crowd, proof of just how entrenched patriarchy and inequality truly are. Women are so oppressed, they don't even know it. Year after year, these activists make claims about women in violence, women in depression, women in eating disorders, women in workplace injustice, to support their views. Over the years, I have looked carefully at many of these claims. And what I have found is that much of the supporting evidence, mostly victim statistics, is misleading and often flat out wrong. Consider the issue of the so-called gender wage gap. How many times have you heard that for the same work, women receive 77 cents for every dollar a man earns? This charge is constantly repeated by feminist activists and their supporters. Yet it is so deeply misleading as to border on outright falsehood. 23 cent gender pay gap is simply the difference between the average earnings of all men and women working full time. It does not take account for differences in occupations, positions, education, job tenure, or hours worked per week. Now, wage gap activists and groups like the American Association of University Women or the National Women's Law Center, they say, no, no, even when you control for these factors, women still earn less. Well, it always turns out that they have omitted one or two crucial data points. Take the case of doctors. On the surface, it looks like female physicians are clearly victims of wage discrimination. They appear to earn less for the same work. But dig a little deeper beneath the surface, and you find that women are far more likely than men to enter lower paying specialties like pediatrics or family medicine than higher paying cardiology or anesthesiology. They are also more likely to work part time. And even women who work full time put in about 7% fewer hours than men. Women physicians are also far more likely to take long leaves of absence, usually to start a family. Now there are exceptions, but most workplace pay gaps narrow to the point of vanishing when one accounts for all of these relevant factors. Now, how do the women's advocacy groups react to this? They insist that women's choices are not truly free. Women who decide, say, to stay home with children or to work fewer hours or to become pediatricians rather than heart surgeons are held back by invisible barriers or internalized oppression. According to the National Organization for Women, Powerful sexist stereotypes steer women and men toward different educational training and career paths and family roles. But is it really social conditioning that explains women's vocational preferences and their special attachment to children? Perhaps in the pursuit of happiness, men and women take somewhat different paths. 
And isn't it more than a little patronizing to suggest that most American women are not free? They're not self-determining human beings? And here is common sense proof that the male-female wage gap is untrue. If it were really true that an employer could get away with paying Jill less than Jack for the exact same work, wouldn't most employers fire as many of their male employees as possible and replace them with females and enjoy a huge market advantage? As a regular campus lecturer, I routinely encounter students who have fully accepted the feminist propaganda. American college women are arguably the most fortunate, liberated beings on the planet, yet in their feminist theory classes, they're likely to learn that they are put upon and tyrannized by men. And the more elite the school, the more advanced the degree, the more likely they are to take such feminist propaganda seriously. But this doesn't have to continue. The time has come for young women to take back feminism, reform it, correct its excesses, repudiate the victim propaganda, get rid of the women are from Venus, men are from hell storylines, and begin the arduous task of correcting almost three decades of feminist misinformation. And women who are plagued by workplace injustice or sexual violence will be best helped by truth and solid research, not by hysteria and hype. And as a final piece of personal advice for young women, appreciate and make good use of the unprecedented freedom that you have. I'm Christina Hoff Summers of the American Enterprise Institute for Prager University. You probably think your opinions matter. You probably think you're an individual with unique experiences, thoughts, and ambitions. Well, I hate to break it to you, but according to current leftist orthodoxy, you're wrong. You see, your opinion only matters relative to your identity and where that identity ranks on the hierarchy of intersectionality. If you're now thinking, what the hell are you talking about? You haven't spent much time on a modern college campus. Intersectionality is a form of identity politics in which the value of your opinion depends on how many victim groups you belong to. At the bottom of the totem pole is the person everybody loves to hate, the straight white male. And who's at the top? Well, it's very hard to say because new groups claim victim status all the time. No one can keep track. So, how does this intersectionality thing play out? Something like this. Let's say you're a gay white woman. Your opinion matters, but less than that of a gay black woman. Why? Because while all women are oppressed by the patriarchy and all gays are oppressed by the heterosexual majority, blacks have a victim status that whites obviously don't. Of course, a gay black woman's victim status is less than that of a black trans woman who ranks below a black Muslim trans woman, and so on. The more memberships you can claim in oppressed groups, the more aggrieved you are and the higher you rank. Get it? Good, because it's about to get even more complicated. Intersectionality takes your victim status and uses it as the basis for creating alliances with other victim groups. 30 or 40 years ago, activists encouraged racial solidarity among blacks to combat oppression. But today, that's not enough. Today's activists demand blacks make common cause with other allegedly oppressed people, gays, lesbians, transgenders, Palestinians, Native Americans, whomever. Here's the logic. A black gay and a Hispanic gay may not belong to the same victim group racially, but they do belong to the same victim group on the basis of their sexuality. By focusing on the places where various victim identities intersect, intersectionality creates a united us versus them paradigm. Righteous victims rising up together to fight the oppressor, those dreaded straight white men. This explains why at a rally protesting the treatment of Palestinians by Israel, you might see a contingent of lesbian activists. That's intersectionality at work. They're so united by their victim status that it doesn't matter if Islamists throw gays off of buildings or murder female family members who defy their father's wishes. Victim solidarity trumps all other considerations. The term intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, a professor of law at Columbia University. She explains that intersectionality was my attempt to make feminism, anti-racist activism, and anti-discrimination law do what I thought they should, highlight the multiple avenues through which racial and gender oppression were experienced. To Crenshaw, America is a terrible place full of victim groups, each with their particular set of grievances. Why shouldn't these victim groups get together and form a political coalition unified by the belief that the majority society has harmed them? That some professor tucked away in an ivory tower would come up with this nonsense is not surprising. What is surprising and disturbing is that so many people actually go along with it. America is the most open, least racist nation on the planet. That Professor Crenshaw is free to spin her nonsensical theories and get paid well for it 
should offer adequate proof of that. And since when do you have to live someone's experience in order to understand them? You don't have to live as a slave in order to understand that slavery is cruel and wrong. You don't have to live as a woman in order to recognize the evil of rape. Finally, and most important, intersectionality promotes the biggest hoax of all, that we aren't individuals who are to be judged on the basis of how we act, but are merely members of groups to be judged on the basis of our group identity. In other words, you and I as individuals with our unique experiences, thoughts, and ambitions count for nothing. Our racial and sexual identity count for everything. It's hard to imagine an idea less likely to produce a free and equal America than that. But what do I know? I'm just a straight white male. I'm Ben Shapiro for Prager University. Who's the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court? My guess is that most Americans would answer Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's so famous now that she's often referred to by just her initials, RBG. Elevated to the high court by President Bill Clinton in 1993, the left-leaning Justice Ginsburg was the subject of not one, but two movies in 2018 alone. But she isn't the first female Supreme Court justice. She's the second. The first doesn't have a movie named after her. That's because Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed by a Republican president, Ronald Reagan. We hear a lot about the Year of the Woman, the Women's March, and the War Against Women. But if the major media, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, CBS, and others were more interested in accuracy than advocacy, it would be that they are promoting the Year of the Leftist Woman or the Leftist Women's March. The major media like to pretend that all women think alike and that conservative women are just the exception that proves the rule. But according to a 2018 Pew Research study, about a third of women are Democrats, a little less than a third are Republican, and a little more than a third are Independents. So if there are all these conservative women around, how does the media make it seem like they barely exist? They use three strategies. The first is omission. If you don't see something, you don't have to deal with it. Open up a glossy magazine. Every liberal woman is glamorized, stylishly dressed, beautifully photographed. Their personal stories are almost always an inspirational version of Joan of Arc. They have overcome overwhelming obstacles to make the world a more compassionate and tolerant place. Glamour magazine recognized 11 Democrat women among their 2018 Women of the Year. No Republican made the cut. First Lady Michelle Obama was on the cover of Vogue three times. First Lady and former fashion model Melania Trump? So far, not once. Every now and again, the major media will do a story about a female conservative to balance things out. But let's be honest, it's not balance, it's tokenism. The second strategy the media uses to diminish conservative women is mocking. Making fun of a woman's appearance discounts what she says. You would think the major media would resist this kind of objectification, but they don't. Not if the target is a conservative woman. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the White House press secretary, and Kellyanne Conway, the first woman to run a winning presidential campaign, are routinely belittled for their hair, their eye makeup, or their weight. Their significant accomplishments, in contrast, are rarely acknowledged. Why? Because the media doesn't like their boss, and it treats women who work for him as traitors to their sex. The third strategy the media uses to demean conservative women is labeling. Using stereotypes precludes there being a valid reason for conservative women to hold the positions they do. The major media simply can't accept that conservatives have serious and important reasons for their beliefs, so they have to come up with answers to explain this seeming anomaly to themselves. These women must be racist or self-hating or just weak-minded. Here's how Barbara Streisand put it to the Daily Mail in England. A lot of women vote the way their husbands vote. They don't believe enough in their own thoughts. Labeling, like the strategies of mocking or omission, is just another way to display contempt and demonize conservative women. Its purpose is to persuade you to not treat those being labeled with respect, to ignore their ideas, and to even avoid associating with them. Not surprisingly, the vilification that results discourages a lot of conservative-leaning women from running for political office, or even from speaking up. Who needs that grief? It takes a strong person to swim against the media tide. But here's the thing about swimming against the tide. It makes you stronger. 
Maybe that's why Nikki Haley can stand up in the UN and tell the truth, or why Candace Owens can question the devotion to progressive policies that have so hurt blacks, or Ayan Hirsi Ali can take on the cause of truly oppressed women, those living in radical Islamist societies. We need these voices, and more like them. That's why it's so important to encourage a more respectful, inclusive debate. We should want everyone at the table, both sides of the political spectrum, listening with civility. That way we can be better informed and make better decisions. So if you hold conservative views, you have a particularly important role to play. You need to speak out to your friends, your family, and your co-workers. Let them hear your thinking, and then let them make up their own minds. The media may pretend you don't exist. They may even mock or label you. They want to intimidate you into silence. That's not fair, and that's not right. Don't let them. I'm Heather Higgins, Chairman of Independent Women's Forum for Prager University. I've been training to be a championship sprinter since I was eight years old. With the help of my parents, my coaches, and my teammates, I did it. By sophomore year of high school in 2018, I was one of the top five female high school sprinters in Connecticut. But then, one day, I wasn't. At the state championships that year, two people passed me, passed all of us girls, literally. They finished first and second in our races, dominating the field. Were they more motivated? Did they train harder? I don't think so. But they did have an edge, a big one we couldn't match. They were biological boys who said they were transgender girls. Do you think that's fair, males competing against females? Before you make up your mind, let me tell you a bit about what it took for me to become a top female sprinter. It meant training with my team every day after school for at least two hours, working to shave fractions of a second off of my time in the 100 and 200 meter dash. It meant not hanging out after school or going out with friends on the weekends. It meant getting up early every Saturday morning and competing all day at a meet. It meant not indulging in any of the things that might cost me my dream. And here's the thing about the two biological males that took the top two girls medals in the state of Connecticut. Their times were not even good enough to qualify them to compete in the state championships on the boys' team. Let me say that again in case you missed it. Their times were not good enough to qualify them for the boys' state championships. But two years in a row, they won first and second place competing against the girls. All in all, these two biological males won 15 women's state championship titles. Some in the media have accused me of being a sore loser. They tell me to run harder. But the biological changes that males go through during puberty are so significant, they gain an insurmountable advantage in strength and in speed. That's why boys always competed against boys and girls against girls. U.S. runner Allison Felix is an inspiration to me. She's the fastest female sprinter in the world. Her lifetime best for the 400 meters is 49.26 seconds. But based on 2018 data, nearly 300 high school boys in the U.S. alone could beat that record. What we are talking about then is not just boys taking women's trophies, though they are, and we aren't talking about biological boys taking women's athletic scholarships, though they'll do that too. When biological boys are allowed to compete against girls in sports like track, where the differences in performance are so great, we are talking about girls getting shut out never getting the chance to win or even compete at all. When two biological boys took the first and second place spots against me in the 2019 Indoor State Championship, I lost the opportunity to participate at the New England Championships. I lost the chance to be scouted by top coaches, possibly even to win scholarships. Right now, biological boys are being allowed to set records on the girls' team deleting girls' records, erasing the achievements of actual girls, and setting a standard probably no girl can meet, no matter how much she trains or how hard she tries. The reason that we have girl sports in the first place is to give female athletes with talent, hard work, and dedication an equal opportunity to shine and be recognized. But girls will never have that opportunity 
if they are forced to compete with biological boys in sports like track and field, softball, volleyball, or basketball. Women fought too hard for too long so girls like me can have the opportunity to compete on a level playing field. Maybe worst of all, when girls try to object, we may point out the truth that biological differences in strength and speed between boys and girls are massive and real, we're called bigots. Administrators, teachers, coaches, and other students tell us to just keep quiet and take it. We are told a girl's place is to be seen and not heard. Well, we won't be silenced. We are fighting back. With two other top female runners in Connecticut, I have filed a federal lawsuit under Title IX to protect the rights of women and girls to a fair competition on a level playing field. Please don't turn your backs on us, America. This isn't about gender identity. It's about fair play. I'm Selena Soul for Prager University. This video was sponsored by Alliance Defending Freedom.